for many of us. And in some ways, 2020 doesn't quite feel over. Uh, but we finally finished out the election cycle in Georgia on Tuesday. And of course, I, I want to recognize the devastating day that we had in DC yesterday, which I know we are all still wrapping our heads around in terms of the images that we saw, the happenings that none of us ever thought would happen in the United States. However, I also know, myself included, that um, some of us aren't terribly surprised that it panned out the way it did. Um, to me, it just underscores one of the crises that we have going on right now that I've, I talk about whenever I have the microphone, and that is a deep crisis in government and politics. And that's a crisis layered on top of a public health and economic climate crisis um, and a racial injustice crisis. So really, this is a time like no other. Um, thank you so much for tuning up, tuning in to us with us tonight. Um, I just want to say real quick, um, for those of you who don't know me, I have held this seat in the Illinois House for just about a year and a half. And I recently had a moment where I thought to myself, I've been in the seat longer during a pandemic than not during a pandemic. Um, and that's important for me to hold on to as we all seek to get back to some sort of regularity in 2021. Um, before we really get going, I just want to touch a little bit more on how we need to rebuild our faith in government and politics. And one of the ways that myself, my team, and I know Senator Martwick works hard to do every day, and that is to run district offices that are as accessible and as transparent that we can be. And if, you know, we're all thinking about what are some silver linings of one of the most devastating years we've all ever been through. And for me, one of those silver linings is that more people than ever are reaching out to their elected officials, but in particular state legislatures. And we're not really set up for robust constituent services. However, because so many people are struggling with unemployment right now, because so many people are struggling with accessing their FOID cards right now, which is also a state function through the Illinois State Police, and because so many people are just struggling with the foundations of needing to know where to go for food assistance. And we're talking about a lot of people in our area that haven't had these struggles before people are beginning to reach out to their state legislators for guidance. And we embrace that role and we take every interaction with constituents um, as an opportunity to rebuild that faith so people feel comfortable making their voices heard and reaching out for help when they need it. And of course, part of the event tonight, um, th that's what we're doing. We're, we're being accessible and inviting you in to state government. So thanks for being here tonight. And I'm gonna flip it over to one of my favorite senators, Rob Martwick. Well, thank you from uh, my, my favorite uh, successor, Lindsay LaPointe. Um, so um, my name's Rob Martwick, of course, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a state senator for about as long as uh, Lindsay has been a state representative um, because that's how it happened. I was the state representative uh, in the district, uh, the senator was a gentleman by the name of John Mulroe, who was appointed to become a judge. And so I moved up to the Senate seat. Lindsay was appointed to fill out the remainder of my term, and then we were both reelected in November. Um, I, I'm very excited to be uh, serving in the Senate in a, in a larger district, uh, larger role, uh, as it were. Um, it's it's uh, but it's been such a strange year, as Lindsay said. I I, I feel like. While I've been in the Senate for 18 months, I feel like I've, I feel like I've been there for 18 days because just haven't had the opportunity to interact and engage in uh, you know that that process of legislation in the Senate. So it's still sort of an ongoing thing for me. Um, but uh, that being said, um, 
I've been able to uh, begin to start moving some pieces of legislation and, and quite excited about what's going to be coming up. I think, um, I, I think our better, we have better days ahead for us. I always have, I'm an eternal optimist. Um, Illinois has challenges, every state has challenges. Every state in this country and this country itself has challenges and that's why we have a democracy so that we can elect people uh, with values that reflect ours to go and work on those problems and solve them and, and stand up for our constituencies. And I know that Lindsay is gonna do a great job in the house and I look forward to representing you in the Senate. Um, there is a lot of work to do. You know, uh, we were, Illinois has, has had such an up and down path on its finances uh, over the course of the last 40 years. And it seems like every time we, we gain some footing, uh, something derails that. And so um, under the administration of Governor Quinn, we addressed some massive financial problems and we began to start to steer the ship back on course and then we had Bruce Rauner get elected and he basically decided to scuttle his own ship. And, um, you know, so now we're once again digging out of a big hole. Governor Pritzker came in, we started to sort out the finances and then COVID hit. So um, it's an ever ongoing struggle, but there is an Im important part of it. You know, finances, math, it can be boring to some people, but it's so crucial because the, our job is to go down there and fight for how that money is spent, uh, how those debts are paid, who bears the burden, um, and who does not. And and uh, you know, the, as I said, these are challenging times. But um, challenging times means it's it's really doing the job. It actually is that much more challenging, that much more interesting, um, and really that much more fulfilling. Um, than if you were just kind of coasting along. So um, it is good work. It, it's difficult, but I'm excited to do it and uh, looking forward to 2021. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Rob, for that context. And Lindsay, maybe you can start this conversation giving us some context about where we're currently at in terms of session and uh, wrapping up the 101st General Assembly. Absolutely. Thanks, Jessica. And let me introduce you for anyone listening who doesn't know you. Um, Jessica Genova is the chief of staff, which we have a very small team, so don't misinterpret that, uh, for the 19th House District. And she's, especially because we're in a time of crisis, constantly fielding phone calls and emails from constituents all across the far northwest side, Norwich, Harwood Heights. Um, so she in a, in a short year and a half, I got to say, you know the district and the people very well, and I know they very much appreciate your work. So thank you. And thanks for hosting this, Jessica, and being um, multi-talented. Okay, so this is, I think this is really important. I just want to set the stage for where we are. And as a new legislator, I will admit that knowing what the legislative calendar is and what it means for what we can get done and what we can't done, get done is something that you know I didn't I didn't know all these nuances two years ago. Um, so to set the stage, um, as you might know, in in the Illinois House we serve two year terms, um, and um, we are wrapping up a, a two year cycle. So this the the cycle of the 101st General Assembly, and um, anyone who lost their election in the March primary or in the November general election in 2020, uh, they will not come back in mid-January 2021. However, those folks will be joining us for what we call a lame duck session, which we are about to start tomorrow in Springfield. And so the, the bills that we are looking at um, in the next four or five days of lame duck session are bills that could have been, and, and Rob, Senator Martwick can do some fact checking because he's been around a lot longer than I have, but we're looking at bills that have been um, filed as, as early as January, 2019 through now. Um, so this is kind of, this is crunch time for a lot of things in some ways, but 
what doesn't get passed in lame duck, and of course, just by design, a lot won't get passed because we only have a few days, um, can be bills and can be ideas that are refiled in the 102nd General Assembly after all the members, including new members who are coming in in the House and Senate, are sworn in on January 13th. So that's kind of where we are. Just want to remind people that in this second year of the 101st General Assembly, we would have normally been in Springfield three days a week from January 2020 through May 31st. And we all know we weren't. Instead, we crammed a whole bunch of stuff into four days of session in May, and we were able to do a lot, and we'll touch on some of that, um, but there was just so much we had to press pause on. And when we left Springfield around midnight uh, on a Sunday night, I think it was, um, or maybe a Saturday night, um, we, we did not know when we were going to go back. And we've kind of spent all summer not knowing when we would go back. And, uh, we did we like unlike some other states we have not passed a remote voting bill in illinois um and i and we're going to talk about that um but that is where we are right now um and just so i want you to walk away from that context knowing that whatever doesn't happen in the next few days um it's kind of like a, a fresh stage to some extent in january and that's after, shortly after that is when we will all be filing new bills or refiling new versions of old bills. Right. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, that kind of brings us right into our next subject, which was just to cover, Rob, if you could just talk a little bit about some of the achievements from 2020 and well, uh, the 101st General Assembly so far. And, and I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, Jessica. And, and so what Lindsay said is right. You know, each General Assembly is a period of two years. So this is the 101st General Assembly. And, and what a difference, right? Two years. 2019, historic year. We passed $15 an hour minimum wage increase. We passed um, legalized cannabis. We passed a gaming expansion. We passed uh, the fair tax, which didn't pass, but we passed it in the General Assembly, which was no small feat. Um, I'm trying to remember what else. I mean, it was, we passed more significant legislation in one year than ever in the history of the Illinois General Assembly. And then we get into 2020 and we start, and of course, March comes and lockdown. And, and so we were only really able to attend to what would be, you know, the, the most crucial legislation. So in, in 2020, we, we really only addressed legislation that was critical for the ongoing operation of the state and, and to address the pandemic. Um, a couple of exceptions to that, we did pass uh, laws that would permit uh, the Chicago casino to actually come into fruition. Of course, whether or not that happens or not probably is going to Effect, is affected by the pandemic, but we did pass those laws during that special session. Um, and there were, there were some other things that were passed that were uh, kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that I think is really important was that we became the second station, state in the nation to help reduce patients out of pocket uh, cost for prescription uh, insulin. So we, pat, uh, we capped co-payments at $100 for a 30-day supply, which is great because the, I think everyone is quite aware that uh, di people that were living with diabetes were having these skyrocketing insulin costs and they weren't able to afford it, the drug that they need to stay alive. So we passed a cap on that and, and that was really good. Um, we passed a law that helps um, survivors of sexual assault or stalking um, it allows them to keep all of their address information confidential so that their stalkers or abusers cannot find them and, and further assault them. Um, we passed a bill that uh, uh, stops you from getting your driver's license suspended for failure to pay a parking ticket, right? 
I mean, think about it. How are you going to pay the parking ticket if you can't go to work, right? And so we said it, it's silly. Let's 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 stop that. And you know, there are other ways. There are a million ways to go after someone who doesn't pay their parking tickets. Taking away their driver's license is probably not the best way to go about it. Um, we did address so many things that had to do with um, COVID. One of them was the business interruption grant program that uh, many small businesses in our community took advantage of. Um, was it enough? Well, in a pandemic like this, I don't think you can ever do enough, but it was something and it helped a lot of small businesses keep their doors open and, and, and make it through this very difficult stretch. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I think, think that's kind of a, a nutshell, some of the bills that we passed. Again, uh, not a whole lot dramatically, um, but uh, very excited about what may happen in the next four days and uh, very uh, uh, excited about uh, what 2021 and 2022 are gonna bring in the 102nd General Assembly. And looking forward to talking more about that whenever the time is right. Great, thank you so much. Lindsay, any achievements that you'd like to outline? Um, I'm, I will touch on a few more things and, and loved hearing about and being reminded of, of what we did, not only in May, but also back before I was a state rep and then in November, 2019. And I do remember in the spring of 2019, because some very big things got done, including Illinois being the first state to legalize adult use recreational cannabis through a piece of legislation versus um, on, a, on a ballot, which meant we had to work out all the details in advance. But I do remember some jokes going around of, you, you did it all in May 2019. What else is there left to do? You know, which is a joke, but it was a testament to how much um, our General Assembly was able to, to agree on and get done. And, and of course, to pass any legislation, you need a certain number of votes. Um, so it's reflective of agreement uh, across the state. Uh, a few other things. Uh, I don't think you mentioned this, Senator, and I'm proud of Illinois for doing this. Uh, our mail-in voting bill, yep. and that only applies to the November 2020 election, uh, but that, it, that was a tremendous bill that in many ways was an initiative of the, um, the House Democrat Women's Caucus, and now, I mean, today more than any other day, we know how important it is to have a well thought out, safe and secure way for people to exercise their fundamental right to vote without putting themselves at an extreme risk to contract COVID-19. Um, and I, I'm very proud of Illinois in terms of passing that bill and the, the way we pulled off the election. Um, we did some expansion of telehealth, uh, which of course is a way to access your healthcare provider without being there in person. And that's something that I think we had all heard of in the past, but not something we were all familiar with and certainly not something that many of us have engaged in. And I can't tell you how important that is, especially right now in terms of mental health and, and the fact that we passed a law expanding it basically put some structures in place where providers and people um, know what know what to do. Um, it makes it it's so much easier when there's a framework for it. Um, I was particularly pleased also about the Chicago casino bill. Um, we were this is this is in some ways kind of a fun one, but really it was to support the hospitality industry. Um, I was one of the leaders that passed a bill to allow, cocktails to go if they are securely packaged up. And that's something that, that's actually been a, an important lift to our local bars and restaurants. And we passed that bill just for a period of one year. Um, the idea is it's, it's related to COVID. It's not something we wanted to do forever, but now that we're doing it, I know in the near future, we're gonna be 
checking in, seeing how it went, making sure everything was safe and seeing if that's something that we want to extend. Um, and then finally, I could touch on other things, but, but just one other thing that um, people might not know about that I am proud of that we did here in Illinois. And that is we expanded Medicaid, which is our safety net healthcare system for people experiencing poverty for undocumented people age 65 and older. And I believe, as I know many people believe that healthcare is a human right. And I think that was a, just a tremendous thing that we did. We were the first state to do that, especially at this time during a pandemic to make sure that some of our senior residents who are most vulnerable um, can access the basic needs of healthcare, especially during a pandemic. Thanks for covering that, Lindsay. I would now like to turn it over to Rob Martwick and talk about what's ahead and some of your legislative priorities now that we are going back into session and moving forward into the 102nd. Well, thank you. And, and I noticed that we've gotten some questions that have popped up. I tried to answer one briefly in the chat. And I think uh, Alex may have texted a message. So if you want to uh, be on the lookout for that in terms of questions. I want to make sure we get people's questions as well. Um, so I, I'm very excited to go back down to Springfield. Um, I've missed it. I like engaging in the legislative process. I like working bills. And I have been furiously working over the course of the last two days um, to because I am, um, I believe I'm in a position where um, I am ready to finally, after six years of ad advocacy, I am able to pass um, through the General Assembly a bill that will create an elected representative school board for the Chicago Public Schools. Um, so I've been calling members of the Senate. So the, the bill, um, for those of you who don't know, it's been sort of something that has been uh, my top one of my top legislative priorities for the last six years. I've passed it through the House three times. Um, the last time I passed it through the House was in 2019 when I was the chief sponsor as the state representative from the 19th district. Um, and so the bill left the House after passing and going to the Senate. And then I got appointed to the Senate. And so I approached the Senate sponsor of the bill and I said, hey, would you mind if I took over sponsorship of the bill? So I have sponsorship of the bill in both the House and the Senate. Um, and I've been working very, very hard to uh, finally get the bill to pass both chambers. And I believe, I believe that I am in good position to do that. I have my votes lined up and I'm looking forward to getting down there and getting a vote on this and putting this on the governor's desk and, and finally getting this accomplished. We'll see. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I feel like I've got the numbers in, in my favor and I'm looking forward to that. Um, couple of other things that I personally am working on in lame duck. Um, uh, one of the things that I have uh, always done is, is um, I've always been very active and involved in our pension systems. And um, uh, there is a disparity in Illinois pensions that um, punishes uh, Chicago firefighters. Uh, it's a really odd, you know, you would think that uh, Chicago firefighters would have this very generous pension uh, benefit structure, they do not. Um, in fact, they have a far less generous benefit structure than every other firefighter in the state. And, and there's even one provision that, that sort of, it's too hard to explain, but it creates sort of a punishment. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of cleaning that up. Um, and another thing I'm working on uh, as we get down to uh, Springfield is um, the city of Chicago has been Routinely, uh, I think this was news today, um, the governor in, in May proclaimed that first responders would be, um, since we were going to ask them to be in harm's way to go to work and to protect us during this time, that when first responders contracted COVID, we would presume that that was a disability that was created in the line of duty. 
Um, and that's important because that provides a benefit structure to them uh, taking care of their hospitalization bills. And, and since that time, the city of Chicago has qualified three firefighters as line of duty disability. And all three of those firefighters are the three, well, those are the three firefighters who've died from COVID. Every other firefighter, 2,000 plus firefighters who've contracted COVID, the city has denied them uh, line of duty disability benefits. And so I'm going down there to try and address that so that our firefighters and our first responders know that we appreciate the work that they're doing for us and the harm's way that they're putting themselves into. Um, those are the two things that I'm going down there with priorities for. However, there is, uh, and I think this was mentioned, there are um, four very, very, very big comprehensive bills. Um, in response to um, the deaths, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and uh, others, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus decided that this moment was a moment where they would attempt to use the legislative process to begin to address what they saw as inequities in our system. Um, and so they have developed what they call the four pillars of their agenda. And those pillars revolve around, and I hope I get these all right now, um, not surprisingly, criminal justice and police reform would be number one. Number two is um, access to, uh, I would say, health care, right? I would call the second pillar, I guess would generally, Lindsay, you can correct me on that or expand upon that. Um, a pillar on education and finally a pillar on uh, equity and, and access to uh, economic equity. Um, so the idea being that if we're going to solve the societal problems that have persisted for, I would say decades, but uh, it's been longer than that, for hundreds of years in our country um, because of racism, then we need to, it needs to be a wholesale thing. It's not just criminal justice reform. There, there has to be economic reform, there has to be education reform to ensure that, that people of color have the same opportunities to succeed as everyone else does. And so they are very comprehensive. Um, they have just recently been filed and we had, I've, the last two days, we've had long, long, two hour long briefings on these. And what I would tell you is, is that the two hour long briefings uh, each day have been rushed as they try and get through this. That's how comprehensive these bills are. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really prepared to tell you everything about them that's in them because it's, it's too big. Um, I'm giving you the, the overview of it. And every time they've been presented, there have been, even though the bills have been filed and they've been presented to us in caucus, the general public and, and, and advocacy groups are just starting to weigh in today. They started to say, read this bill and a lot of it's good, but that part's bad. And so there's going to be a lot of amendments and changes to these bills. Um, we have a, a long way to go on this. Um, but we are going to try and get some of this done during this lame duck session. So uh, uh, we will keep do our best to keep you informed. Please stay in touch with our social media. Watch for our, um, our, our emails. And I would say watch for any Facebook Lives that Lindsay and I might do um, from down there to help keep you updated as to what's going on. This will be potentially monumental change, right? I mean, when you think about the, the reach of these bills. It is monumental change, societal change. Um, and uh, so, you know, stay in touch and we will do our best to keep you informed about what's in there as we get our way through them. Lindsay, you're, you're welcome to expand more. I'm just not comfortable because I've just had, I'm on information overload in the last two days and I really have to sort through them myself. Thanks, Rob. Before we turn it over to Lindsay, I just wanted to uh, use this as a way to transition. So we're going to get to questions at the end. So please feel free to add them into the chat on both the Zoom and Facebook Live. But David Zoltan uh, said that he would really appreciate the legislators focusing on housing, especially eviction protections. And so before we talk about this next segment, which would be your legislative priorities, maybe you could start with that for David. 
Absolutely. Thanks, David. Yeah, you're you're a, one of my favorite housing champions, and I appreciate all your advocacy. Um, so first of all, and now I can read your whole question, which is good. I do want, one of the things that we did in May and one of the things that we didn't do in May <clears throat> relates to housing and that'll set the stage for some stuff we are trying to do now that will answer your question. Um, so think about back in May, we were three months into our economic crisis um, and yet people couldn't pay their rent back then. And that's on top of the world we live in where and, and this was one of my motivational factors for even getting into policy work. In terms of the wages we pay people and the cost of rent, it just doesn't add up. So pandemic aside, we have a huge housing crisis um, where by design, people just can't pay their rent every month. And, and that in itself um, is a raging crisis. Now we are in a pandemic. Um, so there was a bill filed in May by Representative Delia Ramirez, who is one of our biggest housing champions in the state of Illinois. And it was an emergency housing bill, um, very much needed at the time. And I was helping her with that bill. We were unable to pass it. However, and I share this because it's a, a lesson in how policy can work due to our advocacy and the advocacy of many residents and community organizations around the state, even though that bill failed at the time, we were able to advocate for a larger amount of money from CARES Act to go to rental assistance and mortgage relief in the state of Illinois that was administered by the Illinois Housing Development Authority. And all that money is out now the pot is done. And one of the lessons learned, which we knew was gonna happen, is the, the need for that housing assistance far outweighed the resources that were available. So what happened between May and now, things got a whole lot worse. Our economy, because of the pandemic, uh, didn't get better. Um, and we know in our district offices, because we constantly get calls from residents who are struggling with unemployment, um, that it's truly in every neighborhood across the city. Um, so now we'll get back to this, what are my priorities for a lame duck question. Doing something on housing relief is a big priority for me, not only for tenants, but also for all the small landlords that have been struggling. And um, there, Rep Ramirez is filing a bill, I, I believe it's already filed and the language for it will, I believe come out tomorrow, which I am a chief co-sponsor of that would codify the some of the parts of the eviction moratorium that our governor has put in place that are that has been going month to month, um, which is difficult uh, for people. It, it's not consistent. Uh, it's a stopgap measure and it doesn't provide stability uh, for landlords or tenants. So one part of it is codifying that eviction moratorium. Another part of this housing bill um, that has been introduced and the language will come tomorrow is related to ceiling evictions. And that's really important because right now when an eviction is filed, even if it doesn't go through to the end, even if somebody isn't actually evicted, that is there on their record. And as you can imagine in the last year, well, well, not exactly in the last year because we've had an eviction moratorium, but let's say the eviction moratorium is listed. Those filings would go through the roof. And then all of a sudden we would have thousands of people who we've just put up an incredible barrier for, for housing stability in the future because they have an eviction on their record. Another part of the bill is codifying the state rental assistance uh, program. And that's important because in this latest federal relief bill that we finally passed at the end of December, there was 25 billion dollars included in it um, 
for rent relief all across the country. And what that means for Illinois is we're probably going to get between 800 and 900,000. When Ida rolled out our rental assistance program in the late summer, it was bumpy to be diplomatic. Um, not only wasn't there enough funding, the community organizations that were partnering with Ida to communicate with residents and get that money out the door struggled with it. The communication wasn't as clear as it should could be. Um, some people were just not even eligible. So we wanna make some changes to make sure that our most vulnerable residents across the state are actually eligible for that assistance. Um, and then finally, there's a component of the bill that is really meant to support small landlords by putting a stay on um, foreclosures um, and provide, providing to support for small landlords. Uh, I, I kind of jumped into the details because this is something I've spent a lot of time on in the last three or four days, just like Senator Martwick has been spending a lot of time on the elected school board bills. Um, and so we just get immersed. Um, but this is a bill that is not that different from a bill that New York State passed on Christmas Eve. Uh, they were there in Albany doing the work because residents of the state of Illinois desperately needed that. Um, so that's a big thing I'll be working on uh, in lame duck. Woo, that was a lot. Thank you for the question, David. Um, Got to touch on a few more things, even though I've been talking a lot. And, and really right now, because we have just a limited number of days to do a lot of things, um, that is what we're focused on. There is something in Illinois called the solar cliff. And essentially, there was some funds allocated back in a bill in 2016, I believe it was, called the Future Energy Jobs Act that went to the solar industry. Um, so homeowners and other entities and communities could access funds to um, get things like solar panels set up. And there's been an industry that's been created and a lot of jobs that have been created based on that funding. And that funding actually is, unless we make this legislative change um, in lame duck, it, it will go away and 3,500 to 6,000 jobs will be lost. And we are advocating for something called, I think it's called the, the solar fix or something. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Getting things jumbled because we're in a crunch here. Um, but this is something that's a priority for me. There are residents across the 19th district who are slated to lose their jobs in the solar industry unless we make this fix. And the, the, what I've been learning over the last few weeks as I've been talking to our environmental advocates about this bill is the money is, is there. It's just a, it's like a procedural, not procedural, but a, a fix in the law that has to be made to allow this money to be released to continue to support this industry. However, the money that's already there will only support the industry for the next four months. And basically this is a stopgap for what we really need, a long-term fix, which will come with the Clean Energy Jobs Act, which I'm sure many of you have heard of because it is a, it is a bill in Illinois that has the support of public opinion through the roof. Um, it would put Illinois on a path to 100% renewable energy by 2050. And really, that's the longer term goal. That is one of my priorities for this spring of 2020 once we get there. But um, the solar cliff is really important to me during lame duck. Thank you, Lindsay. That so thorough. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So I just want to do a quick time check at 741. And we've got one other uh, question I'd like to ask you. And I think we can tie in a question from the Facebook uh, chat. Tom Jackson asked, why hasn't remote, uh, why hasn't a remote bill passed? Why can't we legislate remotely in the house? 
And so the one question I wanted to pose for both of you is just kind of if you could talk about how COVID and this uncertainty around who the next uh, Speaker of the House will be, how that may impact legislation. And so maybe we can start with Tom's question. Thanks, Tom, for the question. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start off and I'll say, yeah, Lindsay, why don't we have remote legislating? No, I'm kidding. It's not Lindsay's fault. But we did pass a bill in the House that did fail to pass by one vote in the Senate. Thankfully, that wasn't Lindsay's vote. She voted yes. Um, and, and Tom, the, it's a great question. And it, it's one of those maddening things because there is no reason that we shouldn't have this. Um, we should have passed it. So many legislatures did. Um, we should have enacted things so that we could do more um, work uh, and, and, you know, that we need to engage. We need our third branch of, of government, the legislative branch, to be working. Um, it is our job. You know, I, I've said this back when, when we were um, in that special session where the, the the, the initiative for remote legislation failed. Um, I, I said often, I said, look, emergency is the purview of the governor. It's his job to act in the moment for the health and safety of the general public. But it's our job as the legislature to set the policy for the future. And Obviously, as it relates to COVID, how we come out of this pandemic, how we recover from this pandemic, how we address the people that have been suffering, you can't just rip the Band-Aid off. Look at the example Lindsay just gave about uh, people who have been facing eviction, but there's been this moratorium in place. To figure out how all of those rules and procedures and balance those interests, that's our purview. We're supposed to be doing that. And because we haven't had remote legislation, we haven't been able to. Um, so uh, it failed by one vote. There is a new um, initiative, realistically speaking. Uh, by the time we pass this, the legislature will probably be vaccinated and will be able to return with some semblance of safety anyway. Um, but I'm on a part of a working group. Ann Williams is the chief sponsor in the House. I'm the chief sponsor in the Senate. We have filed le legislation, Senate Bill 4030. I don't think it appears just yet because we have a, a different way of posting our bills online than the House does. But um, the idea is, is that in the event that there is a, God forbid, COVID-20 or COVID-21 or whatever the case may be, we want this to be turnkey so that they don't have to start from scratch. So we're putting in legislation that will create rules and it will create procedures where the legislature can turn the key and go into a remote legislation when they need to. Um, so it, it probably won't affect us. We will probably be in there in person this year and, and that's fine. I, I'm happy about a return to normal, but uh, I wish it was something that we could have done. The good news is, is that um, while we failed to pass remote legislation, uh, the Senate did uh, amend our rules to allow remote participation. And because of that, we were able to hold committee hearings remotely. And so these four pillars that we talked about, this monumental initiative for societal change that's being proposed by the Black Caucus, we were able to, through the, the Senate, uh, hold hearings on all of these pillars um, Across over this since since May we've been doing this, and uh, so the Senate holds the hearings, and then we invite the House members to join us, and and so Lindsay's been participated in many of those hearings. So we have been able to do work. We just haven't been able to actually meet and vote and pass legislation, which is unfortunate. But we'll be in person and doing that. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Lindsay, and she can talk about um, the challenges that we might be facing in this upcoming year. Excellent. Thanks, Senator. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge that um, we're giving you a little snapshot of things, and there are so many other issues that we care about and priorities that we have that we just don't have the time to get into. Um, for instance, I am really looking forward to getting to work on making mental health care and services for our families that have children with developmentally with developmental disabilities um, 
to be, make services more accessible. And, and I have a great partnership with Vaughn Occupational High School in my district. And we had a couldn't move a bill last year because we weren't even in Springfield. And I'm so eager to get back to that. Ethics reform is another big thing and getting it done right. Um, we're very overdue for that in Illinois. So I just wanna acknowledge that there's some other things that we just don't have the time to touch on. Um, okay, so how the pandemic, and, and did, I don't even know if you asked about the speaker directly, but it's on folks' minds. So we're gonna talk about it. Yep. Never had we have we had so much uncertainty and and Senator, you just mentioned like that you you think we're going to be there in person this spring. Um, I think from everything I've heard, uh, the Senate's a little more informed than the House. Um, it, until you said that, I kind of I, I don't know, are we or are we going to pass a remote voting bill? Um, there's never been so much uncertainty and we have uncertainty because of the pandemic and, and we don't have an ability to legislate remotely right now. Um, but also if you read the news, you know that our current speaker of the house, Michael Madigan, who's been speaker for I think 36 years and he has been in office as a state rep for about 50 years, I think his anniversary is coming up uh, next week. Um, it's very rare that we have a challenged election for Speaker of the House in the state of Illinois, um, but we are in the th thick of that right now. Um, for, for anyone to become Speaker of the House, they need 60 votes. And um, Mike Madigan does not have the 60 votes and there are 19 House Democrats who have stated publicly that they will not be supporting him. I'm one of them. And I made that statement way back in August and those 19 people are, are not budging. So we're gonna have a new Speaker of the House and there's a lot of unknowns in terms of how it's gonna play out. Um, normally this would be something that would be hashed out and decided in a Democratic Demo House Democrat caucus meeting, um, of which I've been to several of those meetings in my short year and a half. And Senator Martwick has been to many of those meetings and he's been through this process before. I have not. Um, so what happens when, when somebody doesn't budge and someone doesn't have the 60 votes, um, but, but they don't give up? Uh, a standstill. Um, this is something that could play out on the House floor in public. Uh, that is not something anyone is eager to do because of all the urgent work that we have to do here in Illinois, much of which we just talked about. So to be honest, there is a fair amount of uncertainty about uh, exactly how this is going to play out and who our new leader will be. On a very positive note, there are many wonderful legislators and leaders in the Illinois House. And that's, I have you know, several reasons for where I stand on this issue, but, but one of them is we have a large menu of amazing leaders. And, and I think it's very inaccurate to say that only one person for the last 36 years is capable of leading our caucus. And in the last few days, there has been two additional women uh, who are House Democrats who have thrown their hat in the ring to say, I'm in this race to be Speaker of the House too. And that is Representative uh, Kathy Willis, who is from Addison, Illinois, and Representative Ann Williams from Lakeview. That's in addition to Representative Stephanie Kifowit from Oswego, Illinois. And just in the last few days, I am being reminded that there's a value to campaigns. There's a value to choices. There's a value to getting people on the record saying that, yeah, I'm hearing you. You want that? We're going to make this change. Um, and just as an example of a change that I think is really important, that is something that um, could be established in House rules if leadership was open to it, is a term limit 
10 years is a is a period of time that there's some agreement on for legislative leaders in Illinois. This is something that other states do. Um, but but that, that's an example of good ideas that consensus can be built around when we actually have uh, a contested election, which is something I welcome across our democracy. <clears throat> so that's a little insight into what might be happening related to the future of our leadership in the Illinois House in the next handful of days. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. And thank you, Rob. Uh, I just want to move into Q&A and we've got a few minutes left. Now, this is a question that came from Eva and she was the first one to ask uh, of all the participants. I'm gonna give it to Rob because it is about taxes and that's Rob's favorite subject as we all know, along with pension. So uh, she says, I often hear slash read about our state having too many taxing districts compared to other states with higher populations. Is this an issue that could be addressed more diligently? Hopefully this process may help to generate, uh, help generations down the line, considering our poor state of health, meaning economy. How can legislators help in, the fir in first reducing expenditures and not just looking to increase revenue? Um, well, thank you for that question, Eva. And it's always wonderful to see you, even though I don't see you, I'm happy that you're on here. Um, and I hope I can see you some soon someday soon. Um, so the General Assembly has, um, and, and you, you do bring up a good point. So um, Illinois does have more taxing bodies um, than do, do, do other states. However, just to be fair, uh, that doesn't necessarily equate to more taxes. Um, what it means is that um, Illinois has more uh, because of the fact that historically Illinois is a rural state and most of our, our governments are based off of a, a township style of government, which means very limited, that if you wanted, if you live in a rural area and your only form of local government is a township and you want to accomplish other things, you need to create separate governments to do that because we didn't have municipalities that could take on all these different roles. Townships are limited in what they can do. And so you get things like where you have real bad mosquito problems, you get a mosquito abatement district. Most of the people that serve on those forms of government, they're appointed to those boards and they don't make any money. They're just administering uh, a service that everybody needs. Um, the, the main reason that Illinois has so many forms of government is not mosquito abatement districts as much as people like to make fun of those, um, but it's because we have so many different school districts throughout the state. And so can we do anything to create consolidation? And the answer is yes, and we have. Um, we've passed laws that allow uh, citizens to initiate consolidation via referendum. Right? So they can go out, get some signatures, place it on the ballot, get their neighbors and everybody to come out and say, yeah, we want to consolidate these things. The reality of it is, is it's harder to actually achieve than you might think, not because of any procedural hurdle. It's easy enough to get it on the ballot, have an election. It's that by and large, while everybody wants consolidation, they want everyone else to consolidate. They don't want themselves to consolidate. Um, and so... It, it, it doesn't happen as much as you'd like, but yes, the Illinois General Assembly has passed in almost every single year that I have been there. We have passed law after law after law that makes it easier and easier and easier for citizens to initiate consolidation procedures and consolidate their gov government. One of the things that we can do and that we're always looking at um, is what we would call um, vertical school consolidation. So where you have a out in the suburbs, you have a high school that its own school district, and you have a grammar school that feeds into that high school, and it's its own separate school district, you could consolidate those into one what we call unit school district. And because all of the kids in the grammar school are eventually going to graduate and move up to the, the high school. So that's one of the things that's out there. But again, um, in, in fact, it's being ex explored right in uh, a community that Lindsay and I both represent uh, in in Harwood Heights in Norwich, they're looking at potentially consolidating one of the local grammar school districts with the high school. So it's out there, Those these proposals are out there, but again, you know, we are a democracy, so it's up to the people to decide whether or not they wanna do it. Um, in terms of looking to cut expenditures, um, I would just point out that 
the answer is yes, we can. And yes, we should always look to find cuts before we look for revenue. Uh, but I would point out to the history of Illinois, certainly the most recent history, we had a governor who came in and said, I'm going to slash taxes and I'm going to make all sorts of cuts. And he was unable to get anywhere near close to a balanced budget. The cuts that he proposed were the most heartless, devastating cuts you've ever seen in your life. And, and I could go through a laundry list of them, but I'll just point out one. Right over at, um, at uh, Irving Park and Oak Park, there is a Maryville uh, a crisis nursery and center for children. And that center for children cares for the most medically fragile newborn babies. And it helps families understand the challenges that they're going to have to deal with. And so these children stay there. And they have dorm rooms for the parents to stay there to learn how to care for their children. And it, it is heartbreaking. It, it, is, it is a devastating thing to go through there and see the care that the people from Maryville give to these children. Bruce Rauner couldn't get within, couldn't get within $5 billion of balancing the budget, but one of the cuts he did propose was zeroing out the care for, that, for those medically fragile children. And that I could give you a list that would take us for the rest of the night, you'd all be asleep. Um, so making cuts is not so easy. Um, we have the lowest number of state employees per capita, one of the lowest numbers of state employees per capita in the country. We are at the bottom of funding education. When you add in education, healthcare, and human services, we're one of the lowest funding states in the country. We are a state that has high debt, and uh, we are actually spend a low amount on our services. So making cuts there is always going to be challenging. Um, you're right. We shouldn't always look for revenue. Me personally, you know, I was a big fan of the fair tax because what it would have done had it passed is it would have helped us balance our budgets, help us pay down our debt and uh, be responsible. And it would have done it by providing those making $250,000 a year or more with tax relief. Uh, but the people of Illinois decided they didn't want that. And so um, we are going to be faced with devastating cuts, really, really uh, very, very difficult draconian cuts. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do on the budget. So stay tuned. We'll keep you up to date on how that goes. The governor has already proposed $711 million, but it's not even close to what we need to do in terms of cuts to, to balance our budget. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do. That's right. And, and that, um, I'm glad we did a little primer on the 101st General Assembly and the 102nd. So that incredible urgent work that we have to do related to the budget that will come it, after January 13th when the 102nd General Assembly is is sworn in so that's I mean that work is it's already happening but it'll really get rolling uh, once we get deeper into January well that so, was a little heavier go ahead yeah. I, I just want to before we I know we're at eight, but um, there was a, an early question uh, from somebody about police accountability and the Black Caucus Police and Criminal Justice Reform Bill that uh, just got filed a few days ago, uh, noting that the FOP Lodge 7 president um, was in the news um, perhaps defending what was happening in DC. Uh, and, and full disclosure, because I've been in the weeds of what we have to do during lame duck, I haven't had the time to fully take in what has happened in DC uh, just in the last day. Um, what, what will happen in Illinois related to police reform, I think is the question. And I, I just wanna share and pull back the curtain that in terms of policing here in Chicago, even though the president of Lodge 7 is somebody who has a loud megaphone, <laughs> there are a lot of other stakeholders related to law enforcement that we work with in Springfield, like the Illinois Chiefs of Police Association, the uh, State Lodge of FOP, and the Illinois Sheriff's Association. Um, so uh, it, it's a more diverse group than, than just the head of uh, FOP Lodge 7 uh, up here in Chicago. Um, and I will say that I know from my experience that 
it's critical that we take some big steps related to police accountability. And I heard that a lot from residents across the district um, who had big concerns about racial injustice, um, big concerns about public safety and how when we don't have the relationship between communities and police that we need and deserve, that leads to less public safety. Um, I also heard from many current and retired law enforcement officers across the far Northwest side. And a lot of these conversations I was having before George Floyd, because they were actually in person before the pandemic, the status quo of how we do policing in Chicago is not working for law enforcement officers right now. And so this, this very big 600 page bill that uh, has just been introduced because it's 600 pages, it addresses a whole lot of things that range from officer wellness to expanding the number of infractions that a police officer could be decertified for. And, and what that, one of the things that does is actually prevents uh, a police officer who has been adjudicated for police misconduct from just jumping around to other local law enforcement um, entities without anyone knowing it. Um, another thing that this big bill does is really makes our, um, the program that we have run out of the attorney general's office that supports victims of crime, it makes that a whole lot more robust and actually uh, expands some funding for it. And of course, supporting victims of crime is such a key part of public safety. And when we don't support victims of crime and we have unaddressed trauma, it, it often leads to victims of crime uh, perpetrating crime. So this is a, a huge bill. There's a lot to unpack in the next few days. And I know that stakeholders across the spectrum, like law enforcement that I mentioned um, in Chicago and outside of Chicago, we're all gonna be weighing in and seeing what needs to be tweaked. So thanks for that question. And, and I would add um, too that, um, you know, an important part of, of this of our democracy is is the process of democracy, right? And the criticism that we get in democracy is when things are rushed through, when they're snuck through, when things are hidden in bills. We always talk about transparency and doing things the right way. So um, I understand that the president of the FOP uh, made some comments that people didn't, uh, didn't like very much. Um, I haven't seen those. I've had enough of yesterday. I don't want to analyze it to death. Um, but what I would say is this. He does represent the 15,000 active duty police officers that that live in our communities and serve the city of Chicago. And, and so if we're going to have a process, everyone's got to be invited to the table. Everyone who's affected, uh, as Lindsay said, all of the stakeholders. And there are many. And, and so I think it's important that you know, that we in the General Assembly, we don't walk in with preconceived notions about people, um, but rather we give them the forum, we listen to their concerns, and, and we adjudge the quality of their testimony when it happens, but we, we should never seek to deny them. Um, and so um, I, I, I look forward to all of the stakeholders talking about this because this is very big and it will affect people on both sides of this issue and, and we need to get it right. And um, the Senate sponsor of this is uh, Senator LG Sims, who I've worked with. We came into the General Assembly in the same day and uh, I've known him. I think he is a, a dedicated, hardworking, quality individual trying to address some problems. And um, it's not going to be easy because of course, most of the problems that relate to policing in Illinois happen in, a, in Chicago. And so, you know, you get a lot of people in a lot of rural and suburban communities that say, we don't have any problems with policing. Why do I want to change things dramatically in my community? And so getting that right mix where we can 
get that soup ready to be passed. Um, and it is going to be is going to be uh, really interesting. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. And uh, you know, like I said, we've got a lot. I think Lindsay said it well. We have a lot to unpack and understand. And we have a lot of listening and learning to do, um, so we can figure out what what's going to give us some reform that that we need we need to we need to pass. So. Thanks, Rob, for that. Um, do we want to try to squeeze in one more question or should we wrap things up? Do we have one more question? Well, we have some comments, but um, we did have one comment that I wanted to end on a positive note from Winetta Kinsey, uh, who just wanted to highlight that she's really concerned about maternal health, especially for women of color. And I'm gonna try to find her, her comment uh, if we've got time to just comment on anything that's been going on or anything we can look forward to on that subject. She said, I feel we need to focus more on maternal health, mental health. I hear a lot about it, but not so much legislation for pregnant mommies, especially women of color, making sure they have all the support they need to have healthy and happy babies. And then, mm, Absolutely. And I, there is a, we are, we are, prepped to do something about that in lame duck. And I'll touch on that real quick, but I'm so, thank you for bringing that up. That's such a key point. And a statistic that I go back to a lot when I think about systemic racism in Illinois and across the state is that black women are six times as, six times more likely than white women to die of pregnancy related causes. And we all, it can be a challenge to describe what systemic racial injustice is or systemic racism is. Um, but when you, when you present it facts like that, it's, that is not an individual failure. Like that is plain and simple, a result of systemic racism. We do not do a good job of supporting pregnant women of color. And that's a problem. What's a solution? So as I was looking through um, the healthcare and human service reform pillar of the Black Caucus agenda, it's, it's big. And there are a lot of different individual bills in there. And, and this can be the value of having a big package instead of bill by bill. So two things in that bill that stood out to me that seek to address this, the stat that I just shared. Um, number one, part of that bill would make it so doulas are covered by Medicaid and our Medicaid population is disproportionately people of color. So if we can actually expand healthcare to provide pre and postnatal care through doulas for families that are poor, that is gonna chip away at that horrible, horrible stat that I just shared. And one other thing that is in that much larger uh, healthcare and human service reform package is a moratorium on hospital closures between January I think it's January 2021 and January and, and yeah, January 2023. Now is not the time that we should be closing hospitals. And when we do seek to close hospitals, they are, guess what, in poor communities and in poor communities of color. And our colleague, Representative Lamont Robinson, who represents the Bronzeville area, has been leading a fight to keep Mercy Hospital open. We already have a large healthcare desert across large portions of the south side and west side of Chicago. And he has drawn a line in the sand and I am a, a supporter of that line he drew that we cannot have Mercy Hospital closed, especially during a pandemic. So thank you for that question and that insight about women of color, pregnancy, what we can better do to support women in healthcare disparities across Illinois, because it actually 
lets us talk about here's a problem and here's a specific policy solution. Yep, that's right. Thank, thank you everyone who engaged uh, in this conversation tonight and sent questions ahead of time. I, I'm sorry we can't get to everyone's, but if you do have anything that we weren't able to cover, I know Carrie put a comment in the, the chat. I know we can't get to that right now, but our email is replapoint at gmail.com. Rob, what's the best email for your staff? Uh, info at senatormartwick.com. There you go. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate uh, us being able to do this and uh, that horrendous year ending and looking forward to 2021. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. We look forward to updating you again soon. Have a wonderful evening.